you know, entrepreneurship runs in the family. Uh, my great grandmother had a cabinet shop. Uh, my grandfather was an electrician. Um, on the uh, Ackerson side, they had a grocery and a hardware store. So this is back in uh, 1860, 1880. So um, my dad had 20 businesses, of which all failed. And my grandfather had three, which all were successful. So I learned early on that um, you have to take risk if you're going to make it big. If you're going to if you're going to make money in America, it's got to be through capitalism. It's just that simple. And so um, my dad said, "Roll the dice," and my papa said, "You roll the dice, you better make it work." And so that was the two characteristics that I learned early on. And when I was eight, my brother and I had a grass cutting company. My papa gave us a lot more, gave us the gas. And then, uh, cut everybody's grass and, and made money. And then when we were 12, we had a gutter company where we painted gutters. Uh, this is back um, before it was galvanized and the gutters would rot out you know, every year, every other year. And then probably my only and biggest failure was when I was um, 16 or 17, my dad had a solar heating company and the solar heating company uh, went under. And um, it was painful. And um, I did not like being involved with failure. Um, and I learned early on that success is nothing but failure with the dirt knocked off of it. And then I uh, finished college in three years and uh, got out of college and was looking for a job. And uh, dad said, hey, you mind helping me manage this bar? And the bar was about $64,000 in bankruptcy. And um, I remember being in the bar for one week, Labor Day weekend, September 3rd, 1983. And it was the most... Um, Magical, magical experience I've ever had. I, I never felt so at home than I felt running that bar. Uh, we cleaned the pool tables up, we cleaned the food up, we put uh, handsome bartenders behind the bar. Uh, we had a Euchre tournament on um, Thursday. We had a little King's Night on Tuesday. We had a pool tournament on Sunday. Just from the promotion to the food to, we were doing like 2,000 bucks a week. And within three months, we were doing 10,000 bucks a week and doing $1,000 a week in pool table revenue. And um, it was the, you know, to always, as a young person, you want to find out what your gift is. And every young person in, in uh, America has a gift. Some of them may be a great dentist. Some of them may be a great engineer. Some of them may be a great architect. And I used to pray in college, just, Lord, give me something that I can do. Because I made great, uh, great grades, and I got through college in three years. But I worked harder than the other kids. I had records in baseball, but I worked harder than the other kids. And I said, just give me something I'm naturally good at, and I'll excel. And when I got in the bar, uh, that was what God intended me to do, is run a business. And it's just been the most natural thing uh, ever since. Um, we were three weeks in it, <clears throat> and... Um, we thought we were $15,000. My dad had a partner who was taking money out of the business. And we were, we thought we were fifteen or 20000 in the hole. We were $64,000 in bankruptcy, basically. And um, this car right here that I bought when I was 15 for 1600 bucks, I had to sell that car for 2800 bucks that week to make the payroll and get beer, which I didn't want to sell this car. I love that car. Um, and um, we sold that car um, in the September 1st of October for 2800 bucks, And that was the the kind of the uh, conductor to get us from poverty to make payroll to get us through October and I remember daddy said hey you know you really need to let this go this thing's going to go under and I said daddy I can fix this I know I can fix this and um, by um, January 1st of 84 we'd uh, paid off thirty two thousand dollars worth of debts and we went to Clark County State Bank and we borrowed thirty two thousand bucks and we were solvent and um, that was a lot of fun from going defensively where you thought you were going to close shop to now we were offensively, we were making money. And then a couple months later, I knocked down the broom closet and put that mixer in over there and I started selling pizzas and the rest is history. I don't know if you ever feel like you made it. I'm not sure I feel like I've made it today. Um, I don't worry about going broke, if that's what you're asking, but, um, you know, I wake up every day thinking about Papa John's, and I go to bed every night thinking about Papa John's. You understand the two big competitors we compete against are huge. So, you know, we have to be faster, more nimble, more efficient, more productive, more innovative, 
Otherwise, you know, we're going to get, uh, you know, we're going to get our clock clean. But uh, I don't think you ever feel like you made it if you're really successful. Um, I, I don't. I think there was a transition from. I think when you're young and you know you have some insecurities, maybe you feel like if you're successful, you can get a date, you can be liked. I think there's an element of reflected sense of self when you're in your 20s, maybe your 30s. Um, and maybe you operate maybe from fear of failure. Um, and I could see myself doing a little bit of that. But as you get more successful, I think you learn to operate from the good in you, from a level of confidence, not arrogance, confidence. And it's just much better to operate from a feeling of, I know I can win if I do what I'm supposed to be doing, versus a fear of failure. And that probably happened when I was 35 or 40, where I went from a reflected sense of self, what everybody thought, to solid sense of self. The one thing about being a great entrepreneur is everybody's going to disagree with you, and they're going to make you feel stupid. And that's, that's the thing you got to get. You know, we just had an incident with the NFL. Franchisees are on us, stupid deal. The first three weeks it was, because strategically it was excellent. Tactically, we hadn't done it before, so we kind of, we fouled things up. And uh, we looked at the science, we looked at the facts, looked at the analytics, looked at the relationship, the day parts it helps, uh, the days of the week it helps, and said, ah, this is a good decision. And um, it ended up being one of the greatest deals we've ever done. And the point of that is, is that if you're factual, and you're telling the truth, and it's total integrity, and the chips, and all the cards are on the table. And it's solid, man, I mean, it's solid. And you make a decision, and um, people disagree with you, and they tell you you're stupid, you're probably right. You're probably right. And that's the thing I feel for young entrepreneurs. When you're in your 20s and 30s, and you have people that tell you it's a dumb idea, you start believing that nonsense. You start believing that nonsense, and I just don't, uh, you know, when, when everybody goes right, I like to go left. And I'm not contrary. I'm just like, man, if the data doesn't add up and the analytics don't hang together, you know, count me out. Uh, I have three, three rules. Um, a, I've got to have total honesty. If you're not honest with me, then, you know, we, uh, we don't have anything to talk about. Um, B, we have to be factual. You know, we've got to stick with the facts. You know, if it's not analytic and it's not factual and it's not scientific, then we're not going to hit it off. And three, I've got to be able to map what you're doing. If, I, if you're doing something and I can't tell what you're doing, in other words, I can't track A to Z, you either got to slow me down, back me up, because I've gone along with things several times, too many times, especially when I was younger, where I didn't understand, but I thought, okay, they're smarter than I am. And every single time when I can't make sense of something, it always turns out bad. And so I have to have integrity, I have to have the facts, and I have to mind map the person I'm dealing with, whether it's an executive, a customer, a supplier, map me through what you're doing. And if I got disconnects and it doesn't hang together, then count me out. Well, uh, three things. I, I hired the, the right people. And the reason Papa John's is great is because we got 100,000 team members that are very good at what they do. Um, second is we've just been totally honorable and forthright with that pizza. We've never cheated in business. We've never cut corners on that pizza. Now, sometimes we didn't know how to make it as good then as we knew now, but there was never a lack of integrity. It was always our best foot forward. And after 26 years, that gives the company such a solid platform of integrity that there's a passion throughout the organization that's systemic that people just do not cut corners. I mean, the thought of somebody doing something halfway in this company, um, you know, it just doesn't resonate. It, it doesn't work. And last but not least, we take care of our people. You know, when they, um, when they, when they do a good job and the um, customer says, hey, I love Papa John's, um, we think that's a big deal and we, we reward them accordingly. Well, I hear this nonsense that kids are lazy, uh, young people don't want to work. Um, we're not seeing that. What young people don't want is to be bullshitted. You know, they don't want to be lied to, they don't want to be fooled. You give them something solid, something truthful, They'll, they'll grasp onto it and they'll run with the ball faster than even my generation. And so um, back to when things don't hang together and, um, you know, I get nervous, then, um, you know, I've just, learned to, um, I've just learned to trust myself. And that's taken a long time. And that would probably be the one thing that I would tell um, the young people is that just believe in yourself. Find something you, you like. Find something you have a passion for. I love the business. I mean, I love everything about this business. I love the people, I love the product, I love going to visit the stores, I love the dough balls, 
I love the marketing. Um, I love building the culture. I'm enjoying this with you. Um, I love everything about the business. And then find something you're good at. Back to the, the, the baseball uh, analogy. I was good at baseball, but I had to work harder. Find something you're good at, and then work it to the bone, and you'll beat the other guy. You'll beat the other girl. Trust me, you just will. Because what happens is success, they get lazy. They are on the golf course. They're doing something. You know, they're not working. But, you know, if, you, if you're willing to work the hours, and you find something you have a passion for, and you're good at it, Sooner or later, you're going to win. I don't care what, what uh, business or industry or category you're in, you will win. When you look at everything you have accomplished, what is it that you're the most proud of? My kids are healthy, they're happy, and they have high self-esteem. They feel adequate in their own eyes, they feel uh, adequate in my eyes and um, they always do their best and they're honest by far the most proud accomplishment you know i don't i don't think you can really teach kids behaviors i think you can teach kids academics i think you can t teach them techniques but they they're ma they're mapping you every second of the day I mean, uh, infants at uh, age 11 are already mapping uh, their parents, their mom. You know, they're all, you know, they'll pick something up and look up, you know, say, is that cool? Basically, they're mapping each other, you know. And so um, the, um, I think the key with kids is just be open, um, be real. And if you're having a bad day, you know, let them see it, but don't hide it. That's probably what I want to say is don't, don't teach them to um, stick their head in the sand. Um, if you're disciplined and you work hard and you're paying your bills and you know you're acting at a high level of differentiation, the kids naturally will function that way. I mean, all kids come out of the household at the same level of uh, integrity or differentiation than their parents. Now they can build from there or they can go backwards, but they all come out of that same level. So, you know, Ned and I don't teach behaviors. Um, you know, you're either waking up every day and you're doing the right thing, you're not, and kids pick up on that and the key with kids is if you're not doing the right thing you let them know that so they can track what's going on you know don't hide it from them and um, they, they know right from wrong but what messes the kid up is when they they see something and you tell them they didn't see what they saw and then you've taught them to go brain you've taught them to stick their hand in the sand you've, t you've actually put uh, holes in their biographic memory and so they got to deal with that the rest of their life and that's back to my my kids um, you know, I'm not the model of a parent, and I don't want to be the model of integrity. I don't want to be put up on a pedestal, but my, my kids, especially my daughters, one's 25 um, Monday and the other one is 21, they know in my eyes they're good enough. And I don't think there's any greater gift you can give a daughter than the dad says, you're good enough for me. You're good enough. In my eyes, you're adequate. And because if you hardwire them where they're not at it, they, they feel inadequate, then they always are inadequate with other, with other, um, you know, mate with their future spouses, et cetera. And you don't, you don't want your daughter operating with some guy from a one-down position. You want to make sure that she's on, she's on a level playing field with, uh, especially in my shoes, with the wealth where guys are trying to take advantage of that situation and they're getting, you know, the girls are getting nonsense and they're getting conned. So you got to teach them how to track that and make sure they don't get sucked into something that's not a good situation. The, back to the question on failure, uh, again, you know, God puts your best where you're most afraid to go. You got to remember that. And so there's always going to be a fear of failure, and that's a healthy thing, as long as that doesn't, you know, override the decision, you know, to try to go out and do something. You don't want to go out and do something foolish. I mean, I've had, I've had business adventures that didn't exactly succeed, but they didn't fail because they weren't well thought out. Uh, that they weren't methodical, that I wasn't thinking about it, they just it wasn't a good business adventure. Well, the, um, our core values are fast pack, and one of our fast pack core values are positive mental attitude, or attitude. And basically goes, if you think you can, you can, and if you think you can't, you can't. And so I think um, the thing I like about a positive attitude is you always have hope, and you never want to give up hope. You know, don't give up on yourself, don't give up on your loved ones, don't give up on your friends. Um, and I'm not talking about empathy approach where you just let people get away with things they shouldn't get away with. I'm talking about um, people you love holding them accountable. 
uh, making them do what they're supposed to be doing. And um, that comes, you can have collaborative confrontation uh, and a positive mental attitude. I think they go hand in hand. You know, when you're an entrepreneur and you come in here and you, you create 100,000 jobs out of a broom closet and you have a liberal base that's firing at you, and I'm not going to insult your politics, and um, you know, I'm not trying to be insensitive, and I don't know what your politics are. If business is unhealthy, it can't provide jobs. You can't provide jobs, then you don't have stimulus in the economy, and it goes full cycle. So um, Kentucky's got to be real careful um, because they're, um, they're leaning towards uh, the far left. The only way you can have prosperity is if you have productivity. The only way you can have productivity is if you have healthy business. And the only way you can have healthy business is if you have a friendly environment as far as taxes and structure and the media. Kentucky's got to be real careful that it doesn't move towards a, um, a socialistic entitlement state. That's as blunt as I can be with you. Um, I feel for you because I'm not sure in 2011 I could build Papa John's in this environment. I got to tell you. I mean, I look at what you got to go through. I mean, the reason I can do things is I got the horsepower. I mean, I got seven million bucks a day to, to go get things done. I mean, I didn't have that when I was in the broom closet. I didn't have that at store 10. I didn't have that at store 100. So this really scares me for guys like you because you are our future. Entrepreneurship is our future. I mean, that's what, uh, 80 percent of the jobs, I think, come from entrepreneurs. And when you, and guys like you are stifled, nobody, you and I are not going to play if we can't win. We're not. And if the environment is so uphill and so arduous that you can't win, you know, you're not going to play. And, you know, so we lose, you know, I don't know if you'd ever create 100,000 jobs, but, you know, maybe be thousands, you know. And, I mean, we, we lost that because the, uh, the marketplace, uh, the, the dynamics of the way the government set up beat you up. I mean, I mean we, what, what an entrepreneur does is when, when I make a bunch of money, I build a park, build a stadium, you know, I give my uh, employees raises, I build more stores. Duh. Not hard stuff. When, let's say you increase my taxes 10% this year, let's say $7 million. What do you think I do? I gotta find that $7 million somewhere. I've gotta cut jobs. I gotta cut utilities. I gotta cut expansion. I mean, this is, it's not hard stuff. Um, this is the way we're wired. Just think of every American family, which is averages $40,000 income, had a 10% tax break. You know, 10% on uh, 40,000 bucks is $4,000. That's 80 bucks a week. What are they going to do with that 80 bucks? They're going to go buy a Papa John pizza. They're going to go to Texas Roadhouse. They're going to go to Walmart. I mean, they're going to stimulate. That's how you do this. So somebody's got to have the guts to go to D.C. and say, listen, out of the pool. It party's over. <laughs> party's over. You know, we're going to cut taxes by 10%. We're going to cut government spending by 20. And, you know, that's that. But I don't know who you're going to find to do that because somebody that's conservative, that has a business acumen, that has the presence and the articulability. I mean, those, those folks, who, I mean, the liberal media kills those folks. And who would want to put, I mean, if you have all the success, why would you want to put up with getting butchered in the press over nonsense? And that's the problem. You know, if we had a more conservative press, I think we probably have um, somebody uh, in the White House that probably could put this thing back together. But, you know, until the Ronald Reagan comes back along, I mean, guys like you are going to really take it on the chin. And guys like me are going to get by. And by the way, the, the, I'm not going to get probably any richer. The problem is the poor folks are, in the middle class are going to go backwards. So there will be a gap under this kind of scenario. The, if we had the right tax structure and the right entrepreneur and capitalism kind of incentives, yeah, I'm going to get richer, but I'm going to drag everybody up with me. So the middle class and the poor are going to go up. The way it's set up now, it's a lose-lose, especially for the folks at the bottom. We have three rules at Papa John's. Best in the class, passion for what we do, and make sure the thing, unit economics work. I mean, if the store doesn't make money, this is a house of cards. So if you've got healthy store unit economics and you're passionate and um, you're best in your class, the consumer's gonna feel that. See, when people think of Papa John's, they just go up here immediately. Well, that's taken 26 years to do that, but it's that passion. And um, if that pizza's not right, or that service is not right, then, um, they know there's a guy behind the brand that's going to probably not be very happy, you know, and they, and they believe in that and, because it's the truth. Again, nobody in this building in this company wants to let anybody down. I mean, everybody has a real passion and thirst to be first class and do things first rate, and it shows up with the consumer. And you can't buy that. You can have all the advertising budget in the world, but you can't buy 
a solid sense of self and a company that's built on integrity. You can't buy that. At the end of the day, what is this business really about for you? Well, this is my life's work. I mean, when you cut grass at 8 and paint gutters at 12, and you're in a broom closet when you're 22, I mean, it's my life's work. You know, it's my, it's my laboratory for product quality. It's my laboratory for interpersonal relationships. Um, it's my laboratory to interact with my community. It's, my, it's, my, um, it's where I learn. Um, it's my life's work. That's what it means to me. It's everything. Outside of my family, you know, I'm of course, but and my friends. But um, yeah, I mean, I love what I do. I'm not, you know, I don't want to, um, I want something that's not for sale. You know, you can't buy this business because we got poison pills in it. You know, and they, and they would have to take me out. And, you know, the, the, they can't really do that. So um, I've got, beautiful thing about my situation is they, um, I get to, I get to live my dream and nobody gets to mess with me. And so I'm either right or I'm wrong, but I have a goal of being the number one uh, pizza company in the world. And I'm 49, I'll probably live to be 85, so I've got 36 more years to get that done. And I've got all the patience and all the work ethic and all the time in the world to get that done. So hopefully it won't take 36 years, but um, that's what I want to do. I want to be the number one pizza company in the world. And I think I know how to go about it in a way that will get that done. Even though the two guys are twice as big, three times bigger than we are right now, just, um, you know, see what happens. <laughs>